Star Wars Shatterpoint, a skimrish miniature game from Atomic Mass Games. This game is beautiful and it's well made and I have the pleasure to make a video for you so you can understand more about this game. In this video I will show you how this game is played, what you can do in the game, how you win the game and what the different cards in this game means. So please just sit down, have a cup of coffee, water or whatever you enjoy and let's take a look at this game. At the start of the game, each player needs to put together two teams that they will be using out on the board. These team consists of one primary unit, one secondary unit, and lastly, one supporting unit. If we look at these cards, we can see a bunch of information. Here we have the name of the character itself. In the bottom of the card, we can see if it's a primary, secondary or supporting unit. If we look at the primary unit first, we can of course see the picture in the center. If we look in the top left corner of the primary unit, we can see a number and two letters. This stands for 8 squad points, meaning that this primary unit can have assisting units in her team up to 8 squad points. On the other units, we can see another number and other letters. This stands for 4 point costs, meaning that this Gar Saxon here will cost 4 points to have in a such team. And the Mandalorian Super Commandos will also cost 4 points. This primary unit have a total squad point of 8, meaning that she can have these two with her in her crew as their total is 8. But up in the left corner we also have another symbol. This represents the era that these units are from. Each of these teams or squads needs to be from the same era. Which just makes sense, right? In the right corner we can see another symbol and another number. This symbol here represents the force in this game. And the number represents how many force this character have. In this case here, as such, have three force giving her, well, three force. But her teammates do not have any force at all. So this entire squad will only have three force. If the supporting members would have had any force, you would have added that to this squad. When you create the force pool, make sure that you combine all of your units force meaning that you should not just look at one of your teams and then take that amount of force pool. No, you need to combine both of the squad's total amount of force pool and put it face up in front of you. Let's start by looking at the unit's stat card. At the top we can again see a name and what this unit is. Below we can see some abilities and we can also see some symbols. These symbols here represent the force, meaning that these abilities here will cost you force to be able to use the ability. When you use the ability you simply flip the token over representing that you have used that force. Of course these abilities will also let you jump, block, hide or deal damage. In the bottom of the right corner we can see two more symbols and two more numbers. The top one is the stamina of this character meaning how many damage this character can take before it becomes wounded. Meaning that when this character reaches 9 damage, it would become wounded. And at the start of its next activation, it would become injured instead. The lower symbol and the lower number is this character's durability. Meaning how many times it can become injured before it is defeated. But each unit also have a stance card. These cards are used in battle. The primary units have double-sided stance cards, 
while the others only have one side. On these cards, we can see this unit's combat tree, but also what happens if they roll a certain amount of defense die or attack die. Up here we can see their ranged value and their melee value. But I will tell you more about this in a little bit. Next we need to set up the battle area as well. And we do this by using the terrain that we have. This is what you get from the core box, which is quite a lot. I mean, you have buildings, you have different elevations, you have ladders, you have a bunch of things that you can go on creating the battle area. Now, the area needs to be 32 inches by 32 inches, giving you a good little square to fight it out on. But other than that, you can really go nuts and create this area any way you would like to. But make it a little bit fun. I mean, give it a little bit of elevations, give it a little bit of different things to hide behind, different buildings, and mix up the areas to just make it fun, right? Next, we need to put out some objective tokens out on the map itself. We will do this by using these mission cards. On the mission cards we have a name, in this case shifting priorities. And we also have a little flavor text of what is actually going on. And next we can see the map itself. All of these little dark circles here represents the objective tokens that you are going to place out on the map. The numbers here that you can see between the objective tokens and from the edges of the map to the objective tokens, these represent these measurement tools, meaning that they show you how far in on the map the objective token should be at the start of the game. On this mission card here we have 4 from the edges, meaning that we take the measuring tool number 4 and measure that amount of distance into the objective token itself. And then we also need to measure the distance between the objective tokens. In this case, it is measurement tool 5 that we use. These objective tokens have two sides. One inactive side and one active side. At the start of the game they should always be placed with their inactive side facing up. Now when you place out these objective tokens, eventually they will end up being below a building. Now, if you were to put an objective token below a building, you will put it on top of the building instead. This is to give the game, well, a little bit more actions. So you have to go up on the terrain itself to actually be able to interact with the objectives. And this is why it is important for you to construct the terrain in different ways. And maybe look a little bit at the mission before you start constructing the terrain. So you actually get the possibility to jump up on the terrain itself and not just fight it out on the ground. Lastly, it's time for us to deploy some units out on the map. We need to start by deploying our primary unit. We will do this by measuring two from the edge of the map to the base of our primary unit. And we can start anywhere alongside the edges that we would like to. Once we have placed our primary units, the other units need to be deployed within the measurement of one from the primary unit. Now, we do not have a measuring tool of one, so we will simply use the edges of number two instead. Meaning that all of these other units should be within the broad side of number two measuring tools from the primary unit. And you could put these any way you would like to, meaning that you could also put a unit on this side here for example, or behind or at the sides. It's all up to you. Then we need to create our order deck. The order deck is cards representing the units that you have in your squads, plus one shatter card. Now the shatter card is kind of like the joker in this game, representing any of your units that you have in your squads. This little deck here should now be shuffled together. And this deck will tell you which unit that you will be able to activate during your turn. 
so you should place these face down in front of you. And during your turn, you will flip up the top card to see which unit you get to activate during your turn. We also need to set up the struggle tracker. Each player will place one momentum cube, this black one here, at the furthest square away from the center, number 8. In the middle we will put the see-through cube at 0, and then we need to establish who is the first player. We will do this by rolling 5 attack die. When the players have rolled their die we need to see which player had the most critical result. In this case this player had 3 critical results. If there would be a tie, the player that has the most strike results, meaning this one here, would become the first player. If there's still a tie, the player who has the most attack expertise results, meaning this one here, would become the first player. If there's still a tie, we simply re-roll and start again. Lastly, we need to construct a mission set. These cards here will show us which objectives that becomes active during the different phases. As you can see on the back side we have 1, 2 and 3. These ones should be put together with number 1 at the top. Then we flip them over to see which objectives that will be active during the first phase. Once we have gone through the first phase, well then we go to the second and the third. But let's take a look at that a little further into this video. First, let's activate the objectives that we need to activate, and then we are ready to actually start playing the game. If we look at the first mission set card, we can see that the five mission tokens in the center should be active. Meaning that these are the objectives that we are fighting over during the first. So we have set up the game, we know who is the first player, and we are ready to start playing. Now, in a game of Shatterpoint, players will take turn, and do their turn to the fullest, activating the little units out on the board by using the order cards. Once they have done their turn, the turn goes over to the other player. And you will win this game by winning two out of three struggles. This here is the struggle board, and in the center we have the see-through little struggle cube. This cube will move back and forward, all depending on who is controlling the objectives out on the board. The active objectives, that is. Because you are trying to take control over the active objectives. Meaning that if you are controlling two objectives during the end of your turn, you would move the see-through cube two steps towards your end of the struggle track. During the different phases, some of the objective tokens will have a priority token on top of it. Meaning that if you win this objective with the priority token, you would move the struggle token two steps instead of one. But you will also get to place out more momentum cubes, meaning the black ones, on your side of the struggle track. And you will do this by wounding one of your opponent's units, or after the player have moved the struggle token at the end of their turn and the struggle token is still on the opponent's half of the struggle tracker, the active player will get a momentum token as well. Or if at the end of the second and so on turn the cube is at the center location, each player would get a momentum cube. But this does not happen during the first player's turn. And you will win a struggle when the see-through cube hits one of your momentum cubes. Meaning that if, for example, you should move it one step towards your side of the struggle track, but your black momentum cube is in the way, well then you have won that struggle. If you win the second struggle as well in phase number two, well then you have won the game. But if you do not win the second struggle, well then you would go into the third struggle and whoever wins that phase would be the winner of the game. So now we go into a player's turn. 
The first thing a player needs to do before they actually reveal their order cards and start activating the little minis here is to see if there are any effects that activates now. And effects can be pretty much anything from order cards or other special cards that will let your units or maybe the environment to have some sort of effect. Once we have checked that, we start by flipping over our top order card to see which unit we get to activate. In this case here, I got the Shatterpoint card. And this one was the Joker, remember? Meaning that I can choose to activate any of my units. During your turn, you can also choose to spend one force to put the unit card that you have just pulled into your reserve meaning that you are saving that unit for a later turn. But you cannot do that with the Shatter Point card. You can only reserve a normal unit card. And you would do this by simply flipping over one of your Force tokens and then just put the card next to your deck as a little reminder that you can still activate that unit in a future turn. When you activate these units, some of them have a symbol up in the top left corner. This is simply to remind you that they have some kind of ability that they can use at the start of their activation. But what can you actually do on your turn? Well, like I told you, you can choose to do two actions during your turn. Let's start by looking at the movements. There are several different ways that your units can move during their turn. But let's look at advanced first. When you use the advanced movement, we use the advanced tool. The one with the full arrow in the center. This tool can be moved in any way, which is a quite cool feature. Meaning that if I'm activating this unit right now, I will use this tool. I will put it with the circled edge towards the base of my miniature and then I would simply twist and turn this any way I would like the miniature to move. And I can put my miniature in any way next to the measurement tool as long as it touches the tool. When you use the advanced movement you need to end your turn on the same or lower elevation that you started. Meaning that if you start at a higher elevation, you could use this movement to jump down. But you cannot use it to move up. Unless you end your movement within the distance of one from an ingress point. An ingress point being a ladder or anything else that would let you climb up. And one being the measurement of the broad side of the measurement tool. So if I end my movement here, I would be allowed to climb up this ladder to get up on a higher elevation. If your character is engaged with a unit that is not wounded, engaged meaning that you are within the distance of two from the enemy unit, then you cannot choose to advance that unit. Instead you would need to dash. Dash is this little smaller measurement tool. It will still give you a little escape, but you will not get that far away. You could also choose to climb up on any elevation. Meaning it does not matter how high it is, you could still climb it. And you will do that by using the dash measurement. Putting the dash measurement at the higher elevation and put it according to your base edge. Now this character can jump up on the higher elevation. Again, if your character is engaged with a unit that is not wounded, you cannot jump. Instead of climb, you can also choose to jump. Again, we use the dash tool. And we can jump up on any elevation. We need to measure again from the elevation we would like to jump up on. Take our character and put it on that elevation. Just remember that when your character jumps and land, they cannot overlap any terrain. Their base needs to be fully within the surface that they land on. And then we have the push and pull action. In that case we will use this measurement tool here instead. 
this here being the length that you can push or pull an object. It is angled this way so you can easily put it in between small little objects to see how far it will push or pull the object. You can of course not push a character or object through another object because, well, they're not made of stone. Sometimes an effect will let you move something towards you or away from you. And sometimes it can be a little bit hard to determine where it will actually end up. This is where we use the advance tool to see in which direction it can actually go. This here is, this here is the border on how far the object can actually be pushed away or be moved towards whatever it is moving towards. Which is quite a smart idea. That was the movements that you can do in this game, which is quite a lot and the movements in this game is quite versatile. I mean these little movement tools here that can bend in pretty much any direction that you want to gives you a lot of options. And like I said, you do not need to end up in the other edge of this measurement tools. No, you can end up in any side as long as you are connected to the tool, which gives you the opportunity to turn a lot or maybe move back and hide behind something. This gives you a lot of opportunities. And speaking of hiding, well, how do you do that? If you are standing behind terrain that is higher or the same height as you and your attacking unit, you are considered to be in cover. If any portion of your base can be drawn in a straight line to the attacker's base. And the attacker of course need to use a ranged attack, otherwise they wouldn't be able to hit you at all. You also need to be within the range of 1 from the terrain that you are taking cover from. Meaning that if you are further away than one, well then you are not in cover anymore. You need to be within one measurement from the terrain that you are covering behind. And when you are in cover, you get to roll one more defense die if you are attacked. A character can also use an action to get a hunker token. These hunker tokens will let this character roll one extra defense die per token that they have. At the start of this unit's next activation, it will lose all its hunker tokens. Or if it becomes engaged. If you can move and take cover, that would mean that you can also become attacked, right? Otherwise it would be weird for you to just take cover and hide behind things. But how do you actually attack another unit? Well, of course, you would need to be within the reach of whatever attack you are doing. And you also need to have line of sight. If you can draw a clear line between you and your victim, well then you have line of sight. If your victim should be behind any terrain, but you can still draw a line between the bases, well then your victim is considered to be in cover and gets to roll one more defense die, remember? But you also need to make sure that you have enough range on your weapon to actually be able to hit your target. If you are engaged with your victim, you cannot do a ranged attack, and you have to fight melee instead. To know if you are within range, you need to look at your stats. This here is your range stats, and this here is your melee stats. This here is how many attack die you get to roll while doing ranged or melee. And this here is the amount of defense die you get to roll while defending against ranged or melee attacks. To see your range you need to look under the ranged weapon. In this case the range of this clone support's weapon is 4. So we would need to use measurement tool 4 to make sure that we are within range. In this case we are well within range and we can do the attack. So now let's look at the outcome. This is what the Mandalorian rolled in his attack. And this is what the commander rolled in their defense. The Mandalorian rolling 6 die according to their ranged weapon. And the commando rolling 4 die according to their defense. As we can see we have different results on the die. But what do they mean? 
Well, to know this, we need to look at the card itself. As we can see here, there are different spaces out on the stat cards. These represent the specialties of that unit. Here we have the range specialties, the melee specialties, and the defense specialties. And the same thing with the Mandalorian. We can see here that they have rolled two attack specialties. This means that we need to look at their shard. As we can see up here, if they roll one to two specialties, they get to change one of those results into a strike instead. This one here is a total miss, and we cannot use this one for anything. This here is a critical hit, meaning that we cannot change it, and these two here are normal strikes. Our opponent on the other hand got one defense and two defense specialties. To know what that means we need to look at their armor. If they roll one, two, three specialties, they can change them into the defense result instead. The last one here is also a miss and cannot be used. Meaning that in this case here, we actually only managed to get one hit. We have one, two, three, four. But the commander have three defense results. So we only managed to get one hit. Next we need to look at our combat tree. This here is the attacks that we can do, depending on how many hits we got. Now we only got one hit, meaning that we can only choose to do one of the first results. But if we would have gotten two hits, we could have chosen one of the first and the second. If we would have gotten three or four hits, we would have been able to choose the first, second and third, fourth, fifth and so on. But what do these results mean? Well this one here on the top means that first you will pin the enemy unit, meaning that they cannot move, and then you will do one damage. The other one down here means that you will shove them and then do damage. At the second one you will shove and do two damage. Here you get to choose, either you disarm them or you expose them. Here you again shove and make damage and in the end you make two damage. When you're out doing battle, sooner or later you will get a condition. In this game there's four different conditions. This one here is pinned. And the next time a character in this unit would advance, dash, climb or jump, it does not move but on the next activation, it will be gone. This one here is strained, and when a character in this unit moves, attacks, makes an action or uses the activate or reactivate ability, after the effect is resolved, the unit suffers three damage. Then the unit will lose this token. Then we have these two left. This one is exposed. While defending character in this unit cannot use defense expertise results. The next time a character in this unit makes a defense roll, you remove any defense die with the expertise results on. Lastly we have disarmed. While attacking, characters in this unit with this status cannot use expertise attack result. Which means that the next time a unit with this condition gets an expertise result, it is removed. This combat tree here is really, really cool and gives you a lot of different ways of you to fight, engage, make damage, push, even jump, get out of the way and get into the battle. I mean, you can choose different ways, you can choose different paths. And as I told you, the primary figures here, they have double-sided of these cards. So they have even more ways of you to make the battle come alive. If you manage to get enough strikes to make damage, you place damage token on the target's card. And when you place enough damage tokens, to reach their stamina, they will receive one wounded token. And on the next activation of this character, we will flip that token over. And now they are injured. We will remove the damage tokens. When we have done 9 damage again on that character, 
we give that character a new wounded token. And again, on the next activation, well, that character will be injured again. If they have the same amount of injured tokens as their durability, well, then they are removed from the game. And as you might remember, if you manage to wound one of your enemy's units, you get to take a momentum token and put it on the furthest available spot on the struggle track making it easier for you to win the upcoming struggles. Besides movements and attack, you also have the different abilities on your character's cards. Some of these will be used at the start of your turn, meaning before the activation, and some of them will be used during activation, while others will be used at the end of your activation. These abilities are quite, quite handy in battle, and it's a good thing that you, before starting to play the game, get to know the different abilities. When you can use them, when you should use them, how you can incorporate it in your tactics to reach your goal of actually winning these objectives. And how do you actually win an objective? So the main goal in this game is to control the objectives. But how do we do that? Well, at the end of a player's turn, if they have most characters from their squads within the range of two of the objective tokens, then we win the objective. As we can see here, these two characters are well within reach of two of the objective token. So it all comes down to if this character over here is within reach. Which means that we would need to measure from the token to the character in the back. And as we can see here, this character is within reach of the objective token. This means that the player controlling the Red Mandalorians here are the ones that are within control of this objective token at the end of this turn. Which means that we should now put our control token on the objective to show that the red, the evil player, is in control of this token. But if this character would not have been here, it would have been a tie, and no one would have gotten control over the objective. When a unit is fighting over an objective, they cannot be wounded. In this example here, we have two characters that are not wounded within reach of the objective token. So it would be a draw, right? Well, not really, because there's actually a character down here as well, that is also within range of the objective tokens, even though that they're on another elevation, meaning that in this case, the good guys actually gets the objective. But if the evil player would have another character on the same elevation, and their opponent would have one character on the elevation and one unit on another elevation, well then, the evil ones would win. Because the ones that have the most characters within reach of the objective on the same elevation goes first. At the end of your turn, if you have used all of your order cards, well then you would need to shuffle them to create a new deck. At the end of a player's turn, if they are controlling any objectives, they get to move the struggle token that many steps. Meaning that if they are controlling two objectives, they move the struggle token two steps. And remember that if the little see-through cube here, the struggle token, is on your opponent's half of the struggle track, well then the active player, meaning you, get one more momentum token. But if it would still be on zero at the end of a turn, but not the first turn, remember? Well, both players would get the joy of getting a momentum token. When the struggle token hits one of a player's momentum tokens, well, that player wins this struggle. When this happens, we need to do a little cleanup. First, we need to take away all of the little momentum cubes on the struggle board. Everyone except the one on number 8. We also need to put the little see-through cube here on zero again. Then we need to take all of the objective tokens and flip them to their inactive side. But we also need to reveal the next struggle. Now if we look on this struggle card here in phase 2, 
we can see that there's actually two different maps. And here, whoever lost the last round get to choose which map we are going to use. As we can see on the card, we can see some different symbols. The ones that are highlighted here are the ones that will become active during the next round. And the symbols here indicates that you need to roll a defense die. And depending on which result you get, that objective token out on the map becomes the one with priority. At least that is how this mission works. Now this is the mission that you get in the core box. And of course there might be changes from which mission you are doing. That's the way the game goes on. Each player taking their turn to the fullest, activating their units, trying to take over these objectives. Moving the little struggle token back and forward, but also getting more momentum tokens. The player that managed to win two out of three of these struggles is the winner of the game. This game is absolutely great. I enjoyed this a lot. But then it's right down my alley. We have miniatures. We have Star Wars theme. We have this little battle three here on the card, which I think does a lot to the combat itself. We have all the different expansions you can get to it with more units, more battle cards, more missions. I mean, this universe have probably just started to grow. And the game might seem like a lot to learn, but once you have done one or two turns, well, it's really quite, quite easy. And even though you throw die back and forward when you do combat, these little extra skills here that you have on your card, but also on this little card here when you have your special skills in defense and attack, they do a lot to change the gameplay. So it's really not a certain win when you do combat. Same thing when you compete over the objectives. It is not a given who will win from the start because so much things can change in this game. I also really, really enjoy these little movements here because they really let you move your characters out on the map in so many different ways. Another cool little feature here in the core box is that you actually get some backgrounds here, which means that you could use these backgrounds when you are shooting and filming your little miniatures to make it look really, really good. I mean, when you have painted these minis, you want to show them, right? You want to show them for everyone. Why not have a cool background to it? Now let's talk about storage. How would you store this? I mean, there is no way that you will get this in the box. There's just no way. And the box, it's really just a big empty box. So if you want to store your cards or minis and anything here, well, you simply have to put it down on the bottom and well, leave the box. You cannot move it because everything will just tumble around. The terrain itself, well, it would need to go up on a shelf in your living room or if you're married, in your garage or basement. Maybe the attic will work as well. Star Wars Shatterpoint had been on the lips of many, many gamers during the past couple of months. And I see why, because this game is quite, quite brilliant. If you are an old school tabletop miniature gamer, or if you are new to the tabletop miniature gaming world, well, this game would probably fit you because this game is quite great for both. It's easy to learn and it is quite hard to master to see who actually wins the struggle, who will get the momentum tokens and who will actually in the end becomes the winner of these three different phases. It's not that easy to know. And with the expansions coming out on this game, well, the possibilities are just so, so many. And with the terrain on the table, it just looks so, so great. I like this game a lot. I think it's a lot of fun to play. It's not that hard to get into. It's quite easy to understand how the game works and how you play it. So if you want to know more about this game, well, check out the links down in the description and it will take you straight to the pages where you can find more information about the game. Now, if you like my video, you know what to do, people. Please give me a thumbs up, push the subscription button, or just say hi in the comments. Tell me what you thought about the game, what you think about my videos, and I will answer back every single one of you. Now, until next time, my friend, please do not forget to keep on spreading that board gaming love I know you all have. Peace out.